Hi, I'm Dr. Leslie Blankenship-Williams, and in this lecture, we are going to talk about some techniques to identify bacteria. It turns out that it is not as simple as it might seem. When we are used to identifying different species, we normally rely on the way something looks. The way something looks is more formally defined as morphology. So in other words, our major tool for identifying a species that we are presented with, like a rose bush or a house cat, is what does it look like? And that tells us something about that organism and usually allows our brain to kind of process what we see and make a pretty good guess about what type of organism it is. So we call this morphology. That's basically what is its structure. So you know this to be true, but let's use some quick examples of how we apply this in our day-to-day -day life. If I were to show you these four organisms, I bet you could, with pretty close approximation, tell me what species they are. So starting from the upper left, we have a house cat. And you know that's a house cat, right? I mean, you know that it's, it's certainly a cat, but it's not a tiger, it's not a lion, it's not even a lynx or a bobcat because it doesn't look like one of those species. It looks like a house cat and a rather young one and cute one. And then on the right, you have a plant, but it's not just any plant, it's a rose bush. On the bottom right, you have a shark, but it's not just any shark, it's a great white shark. And you can tell that by the way it looks. And then on the left, you actually have two different species. You have strawberries and mold. And I don't know what kind of mold that is, but a mycologist, who was a fungus connoisseur, would be able to tell you based on the way it looked and the fact that it was covering strawberries. So in other words, we use this morphology in our day-to-day -day life to try to determine what species are. That approach that we use for macroscopic organisms does not work very well with the microscopic bacteria. And here is why. If I take an unknown species of bacteria and look at it under a microscope, it looks pretty simple. And not only does it look pretty simple, but it, a lot of different types of species of bacteria all show the same morphology. So what do I mean by that? Okay, what species is this? This is a sample of bacteria under a very high-powered microscope called an electron microscope, which is much better than the ones that we would even see in labs. This is a great picture, very detailed. Still have no idea what it is. Why? Because it shows a pretty generic morphology that lots of different bacterial species use. So it's not to say that morphology is useless in identifying bacteria, but that rather it rarely gives us a complete answer. Now, all that said, I don't want to harp on morphology too much because it is useful. So let's talk a little bit about morphology and some of the terms that are used to describe the different shapes and arrangement patterns for bacteria. And then we'll finally come back and take a look at the different ways that we can identify bacteria, the tools in our toolbox, so to speak. Okay. So it turns out that there are six major shapes that bacteria will exhibit, at least pathogenic ones, and you are responsible for knowing these. They're not fancy, but here they are. A simple sphere is very common, and we call that a caucus. Then you can have an elongated shape that kind of looks like a hot dog or a rod, and that is called a bacillus. You can have a hybrid between the two, that is called a cacobacillus, as the name implies. You can take an elongated rod and kind of bend it a little bit. That is called a vibrio. You can take an elongated rod and bend it multiple times, and that's called a spirillum. Or you can take a really thin, long rod and wrap it around in a corkscrew, and that is called a spirochete. So we're going to go ahead and write these names out here in a little bit. But one of the things that I want to point out is that there are three shapes that are really common. And the three most common shapes are the caucus, the bacillus, and the cacobacillus. And not only are these shapes common, but sometimes when you look at a smear of bacteria under a microscope that are a caucus or a cacobacillus or a bacillus, they don't exist as singlet cells. So let's come back to this picture here. We have here 
a cacobacillus. This is a cacobacillus. But when you look at this cacobacillus, you'll notice that a lot of them seem to have kind of this pairing to them. In other words, yes, there are some singles like here, but then it seems to be a lot of times found in these pairs. When bacteria stick together like that, we call those arrangements. So we also have some names for some of the arrangement patterns. I'll go ahead and write them here and then I'll show you some pictures. So the one that you see here is called a diplo. And diplo has at its root di and di means two. Another one is to actually continue that chain out in which case you have a string of them. So it's not just two stuck together, it's three, four, five, six, et cetera, into a, a string, like a strand of pearls. And we call that strepto. But sometimes it's not as neat and organized as this, but rather we just find them in clumps or bunches, like a bunch of grapes. And we call that staphylo. So these are all referred to as arrangements. So if the cells stick together in, in some sort of consistent way under a microscope, we call those arrangements. And the three common ones are diplo, strepto, and staphylo. So let's take a look at some pictures. Here, we have diplo and strepto together. Notice that in both cases, we're looking at the shape, which is a caucus. So the shape is going to be what is one individual cell. In this case, we have a sphere, which is a caucus. And then you can see in the top picture, there's two of them stuck together. So we call that a diplococcus. Or if you make a big long chain of them, we might call that a streptococcus. Here's another picture. See if you can guess what type of arrangement this is this is going to be a strepto. And not only is it a strepto, it's more specifically a streptococcus. And I have a blue circle for a single cell showing that it is a caucus shape. Bunches are also very common and we call those staphylo. So a staphylo is just a bunch like a bunch of grapes. Okay. So let's go ahead and write some of these down. This is the time to start writing some notes. I'm going to go ahead and start with the morphology. It is important that you use lowercase when you're dealing with morphology, not uppercase. I know the previous pictures had uppercase. That's a mistake. It should be lowercase. So let's go ahead and write these out. Okay, why don't you go ahead and pause the video and try to, from your own memory, write down, why don't you pause the video and from your own memory, try to draw in the morphologies for each of these formal terms. Okay, hopefully you have something like this. Now let's go ahead and put in the arrangements that we just learned about. So we have potentially Diplo, Strepto, and Staphylo. Okay, the arrangements really only show up when you're looking at a caucus, a cacobacillus, or a bacillus. In other words, these are the ones that kind of go together. Vibrio, spirillum, and spirochetes don't usually show an arrangement. Rather, they just exist as singlets. And caucus and cacobacillus and bacillus can all exist as singlets too. So please know that you can have just bacillus that are not grouped together in any sort of way. But if they are, then we would call them diplobacillus or streptobacillus or staphylobacillus, depending on what you see. So we combine the arrangement with the morphology. And so the arrangement ends up being the prefix and the morphology ends up being the suffix.
So I'm going to go ahead and draw some arrangements and shapes for you guys, and I want to see if you can figure out what arrangement and morphology you are looking at. I'll just use some pretty simple stuff. Okay, something like that. So the first one that I drew is a diplo because it's two and it is a bacillus shape. So we would call this a diplo bacillus. The bunch of circles is a staphylococcus. And the long chain of what looks like a maybe a coccobacillus, we actually just use the term bacillus if it's more of a bacillus shape and coccus if it's more of a coccus shape. So I'm going to go with bacillus on this one and I'm going to call this a streptobacillus. Now notice that I'm using all lowercase. Now why am I using lowercase? I'm using lowercase because it is important to discern when you are actually looking at just a shape and arrangement versus something called a scientific name. So a scientific name is the formal name that we give to each species. And without getting too much into the weeds of it, scientific names are effectively going to be um, referred to as scientific nomenclature. And it's not a common name usually. It usually has some root in Latin. And each species is identified by its genus and species together. So what do I mean by that? If you look at me and I say, well, what species am I? You're a human, hopefully. I'd say, yes, that's my common name. We're all humans. But what about my scientific name? What is that? Homo sapiens. How many of you have heard of Homo sapiens before? I bet most of you have, right? So the scientific name is as follows. So notice that I have made it in italics. The first word has an uppercase in it, where the second word has a lowercase. This first word is going to be genus, the genus, and the second word is the species. And all scientific names use that format. So scientific names always have a genus and a species with them. They are always in italics. The genus is always capitalized. The species is always lowercase. Now, the scientific names can be really convoluted and very difficult, not always intuitive about what they are, because again, a lot of them are based in Latin. A lot of them are named after people that you would not know about. Um, but when we shorten them, when we shorten these names, we shorten them so that we use the first letter in the genus and then go ahead and write out the uh, species entirety. So Homo sapiens becomes H sapiens. So let's go ahead and take a look at some scientific names for bacteria, which largely lack common names. So I'm going to go ahead and just list them for you. Here we go. Okay, so I have listed out for you the scientific names of six different bacterial species, of which five of them are pathogenic. Now, the reason I picked these six is because you'll notice that there is some similarity between their scientific name and the morphology and arrangement that we just learned about. Hmm, how did that happen? And how do I know what the difference in relationship is? Well, it turned out that the earliest microbiologists really didn't have a lot of different ways to discern and identify different species of bacteria. 
So what they did is they looked at them under a microscope, looked at their shapes and arrangement, and often applied a scientific name based on that shape and arrangement that they saw. So Streptococcus pyogens has a Streptococcus arrangement and morphology. It is also the causative agent of strep throat, and that's where the strep comes from, Streptococcus strep. Staphylococcus epidermidis is actually the most common um, bacterial species you'll find on your skin. It is a cousin to a more pathogenic Staphylococcus aureus, which guess what? Causes staph infections. So notice staph, Staphylococcus. Vibrio cholera causes cholera. Guess what its shape is? It's a vibrio. It's got a little kink in it like a comma. Rhodosporillum rubrum is actually not pathogenic, but it has the term spirillum in it. So if you had to guess what shape it is, that it's a spirillum. Bacillus cereus, B cereus, as we like to say in jest, to get your kicks where you can in this class. So we make bad jokes. Uh, Bacillus cereus is um, a causative agent of food poisoning. And guess what shape it is? A bacillus. Escherichia coli's name doesn't imply any sort of shape, but I put it out here because I want to talk about the shortening of the names. Remember that if you shorten a scientific name, you're just going to use the first letter of the genus and then write out the species. So Escherichia coli becomes E. coli, and we've all heard of that agent, which can be pathogenic as well. Okay. So how do we know when we use the scientific name versus when we're just looking at a shape and arrangement and if I get a, an unknown species and I look at it under a microscope and it's a staphylococcus, does that mean it belongs to the staphylococcus genus? Nope. Unfortunately, this is where it gets a little confusing. So here's the idea. If I were to take all the different species out there that look like a staphylococcus under a microscope. I might be looking at a couple million different species, maybe a couple, you know, dozen or so that are pathogenic. And so I could make a circle where all species that look like a staphylococcus, notice I'm using a lower case here, are going to fit in this sphere. Okay, what about the ones that actually belong to the genus Staphylococcus. That is a much, much smaller group, maybe about that size. So here we have the actual genus, so I'm going to use uppercase, Staphylococcus, which includes Staphylococcus epidermidis, most common bacterium on your skin, and Staphylococcus aureus, which uh, causes actual staph infections. So what I mean to say here is just because you look at something under a microscope and it's a bacillus doesn't mean that it belongs to the genus bacillus. However, if you have a species that you know belongs to the genus bacillus and then you look at it under a microscope, you're probably going to correctly guess that it's going to be a bacillus under the microscope, which would be mostly true. Once again, I use the qualifier mostly because it's not always that way. And where we see that breakdown between what we see under a microscope and the actual genus name is in this one, Streptococcus. So Streptococcus includes multiple pathogenic bacteria, which may look like a Streptococcus under a microscope, but sometimes will also be a Diplococcus or a Staphylo or something in kind of different. So um, it's not a perfect match there. All right, again, the rule is when you see uppercase, it is going to be the genus. When you see lowercase, you're just simply describing the morphology and shape. Like I see a vibrio, or I see a staphylococcus, or I just see a coccus, or I see a spirochete. You're not saying anything about what species you actually think it is. Okay, so that kind of concludes this idea of what the different shapes and arrangements are. So since there are so many different species that are streptococcus and staphylococcus and diplococci and vibrios and et cetera, et cetera, bacilli, then if we can't really use that to determine what the different uh, species are, what can we use? 
Well, it turns out that in a microbiology uh, lab, there are four kind of clinical approaches to determining an unknown species. So a patient comes in and they have pneumonia and they cough up some sputum and you pick some up and you culture it and you want to know what species it is so that you can give them the correct antibiotics. And how do you determine that? Well, you can do, you can look at it under a microscope and that will give you some information in other words, if it's a caucus, then it's probably not a species that tends to show up as a bacillus or as, you know, um, a vibrio. So at least you've kind of narrowed it down. It's a clue, so to speak, but it's not an answer. So what gives you the answer? Well, traditionally, there are four, again, major approaches. So we'll call these the four assays. An assay is just a fancy name for an experiment. And so the first one is using something called a differential stain. When you write these down, go ahead and leave some space to write additional notes down. So leave some space there to write some notes. Another approach is to use um, media. So we know growth media is like auger or broth. Media can be used um, uh, in two different ways, really, and we'll call these selective and differential. And you, you don't know what that means yet, but that's okay. You probably don't know what that means yet. Okay, and then a third one is to look at oxygen and CO2 requirements for growth. And then a fourth one is to look at nutrients. It's one where you take an unknown species and you give it a nutrient of some sort, like a sulfur compound or a specific protein. So what are you gonna do with it? And that can give you some answers. Now, we'll go ahead and go through each of these so that you can see examples of them, but until we encounter them in the lab, it'll still probably feel rather fuzzy. What I want you to gather at this point from this information is just kind of a, a general idea of the different types of techniques that you're gonna see in lab that are used to help identify bacteria. So perhaps the most commonly used one is a differential stain. The word differential specifically refers to color change. The most famous differential stain is a gram stain. Differential stain relies on some component of the outer layers of the bacteria, and it looks at some difference among them. And the different species of bacteria will take up different colors of dye and show different colors under a microscope, depending on what their outer layer looks like. So let's use the gram stain as an example because it will be coming up. Gram stains look at the difference in the cell wall. So if the cell wall looks one way, then it will take up a dark purple dye and look purple under a microscope. But if it looks a different way, it will show up a little bit lighter and look pink, kind of red. And we call those gram positive and gram negative respectively. So it turns out that that gives us a lot of information. So we can use a differential stain, it's not the only one, but it is one of many, um, to help us, you know, give us more information about what species we're dealing with so that we can come to a, a, cl a clinical diagnosis. So gram positive, gram negative, one example. Okay, we can use that idea of color change though, and not just apply it to stains, but also apply it to media. And when that happens, we call that differential media. So here, I want you to notice that we actually have an auger plate on our left that is filled with blood. So there's actually red blood cells suspended in that auger plate. And I have three different species that I have growing on that auger plate. One is in the shape of alpha, one is beta, and one is gamma. And you'll notice that they all make the auger look different. So you'll notice that in the beta one, seems to be like actually the red blood cells have kind of been chewed up and cleared out. The alpha one also shows a little bit of that, but maybe not to the degree of the beta. And then gamma shows no change on the auger. 
So this would be an example of differential media where different species of a bacteria will do different things to blood auger or other types of auger and give you some sort of color change that is information. Selective media is a specific type of media that has certain things embedded in it that usually allows one species to grow while killing off another. So we're gonna use kind of a little bit of a morbid example here with Neisseria gonorrhea. So this is the agent that causes gonorrhea. And when you think about gonorrhea, you think sexually transmitted, but really gonorrhea it can be sexually transmitted to any mucous membrane. You can have gonorrhea of the mouth, you can have gonorrhea of the genitalia, and you can have gonorrhea of the rectum. So let's say that somebody has a lot of inflammation in their rectum, they come in, they agree to get, you know, a swab of their rectum done, but you know, your rectum has lots and lots of different bacteria in it. It's not just gonna have gonorrhea if you have gonorrhea in the rectum. It'll have maybe a hundred different bacterial species. So how do you discern between the presence or absence of gonorrhea? Well, you can use selective media in this case. So if you suspect gonorrhea, you can actually get in there and swab and then transfer that onto the Thayer Martin medium, which will select for gonorrhea to grow while killing off everything else. And you can see the difference between this plate here, which you can barely see it, but there's some like kind of white showing up there, I've kind of marked it with blue. Very, very small colonies. Gonorrhea is not a prolific grower on a petri dish. It's very prolific on your body. Um, but then compare that to this one. If I took that same swab and just used what's called chocolate medium, and please don't be mistaken, it's not really chocolate. It's a blood um, derivative. Anyway, but if you were to grow, if you were to swab there, you would see that there's actually lots and lots of different things that grow there because chocolate medium likes lots, because chocolate medium does not necessarily inhibit um, certain species from growing. So that's how we can use selective media. All right, we can also use oxygen requirements. So one of the things that we can do is we can take an unknown species and try to culture it with oxygen. We can culture it without oxygen. We can culture it with extra CO2, or we can take away some of the CO2. So those are all examples, and what type of outcome you get will give you some information. So for instance, there are certain species that love oxygen and must have it to grow, but on the flip side, there are certain species that can't stand oxygen and have to be in an oxygen-free environment to grow. So that can give you some information. Perhaps the most versatile technique is going to be to use different types of media that are embedded with a specific nutrient. So what happens is you take a little bit of media and you throw in a nutrient. So I'm just gonna call it nutrient X. This could be like an amino acid, a special sugar, or some other type of chemical that a bacteria may or may not, may not metabolize. And then what you're gonna do is you're going to throw in your bacteria. And the bacteria, if they grow, may use X, so they metabolize it and they cut it up, or they ignore X, whatever X is. Now, these uh, assays are designed so that if they use X, they give a certain color. If they ignore X, they give a different color. And so that helps us determine what species we're looking at because different species out there will use different nutrients. And it turns out that this technique was so common for a very long time that it just became useful to consolidate a lot of these different media assays into a single tube. And this is an example, this is called an enterotube. And in an enterotube, you have different compartments that all have different types of nutrients in here. So for instance, this first compartment is dextrose, so it's like glucose. Then we have the amino acid lysine. Then we have a special amino acid that you don't really see very often called orn ornithine. And then we have hydrogen sulfide and indole and lactose and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You don't need to write any of this down. My point being that there's a different specific nutrient that we're looking at in each compartment. You take 
a, a metal rod. You could actually see it through the entero tube. And you take a swab of your pure culture and you ram, you literally ram rod, ram rod that rod through the entero tube and it inoculates every single one of these compartments. You let the entero tube grow overnight or over 48 hours and then you look at the color. And so for instance, you can see here two choices, green or blue. That's the citrate one. So some species metabolize citrate and give a blue color, some species ignored citrate and give a green color. If you compile enough of these different types of assays, you can get a pretty good idea about which species you have because species are generally consistent in what they do with the nutrient. So in other words, E. coli is one of these, where another similar species called Enterobacter does this. Okay, so you can compile these together and get a pretty good idea. The drawback to these techniques is that they take some time. So for instance, if you want to know what species you have so that you can give a patient the appropriate antibiotics, but it takes 48 to 72 to maybe even 96 hours to go through all of these steps to get a pretty good idea about what you have, that might be five days from now and you don't have that kind of time. So another way to approach identifying bacteria is much more accurate, quicker, but expensive. And this is looking at their actual DNA signature. You know how like when you sign a document, you have a specific signature that is supposed to be just your unique way of signing your name that nobody else should be able to replicate? Well, it turns out that all of us genetically unique species have our own DNA sequence that is uniquely ours. And so my DNA is going to be 99.99% similar to your DNA because you're another human, but I might only be 70% similar to a bacteria, which is not a human at all. So different bacterial species have different nuances in their sequence. And remember that sequences of DNA are just combinations of A, C's, T's and G's like so. So one species, let's call this species one, might look like this, where another species might be really similar, but instead of a C at that fourth position, they have a T. There are nationally maintained databases of different genetic signatures or DNA signatures for all different types of bacteria. So if you can go through some biotechnology um, steps, which are again expensive and many small like clinics for sure, but even hospitals may not have the ability to do this um, rapidly or on site. But if you can obtain that DNA signature, you can reference it against a database and you can get an almost instantaneous answer to what species you have. So we might consider this one to be the gold standard, so to speak. So we'll call this our little, it's gonna be our gold standard. We'll give it a little gold ribbon here. That wasn't a great ribbon, but you get the idea. Okay, that concludes our lectures about different ways to identify bacteria. Thanks for watching.